all right good morning and welcome to the session here guys uh, a very warm welcome to the session here so i hope i'm audible and visible to everybody right i hope i'm audible and visible to everybody over here so guys as previously discussed we are doing this series on your current affairs wherein we are covering the current affairs from january up till july here right so that is what we are doing over here so we are going this uh, we are going about or we are taking up the series wherein we'll be covering the current affairs pertaining from january up till the month of your uh, july over here right so that is how we will be going about it now going on further talking about uh, what we'll be catering to today so we've already covered the month of january yesterday so today we'll be continuing with the month of february right so that is all about it here now talking about uh, the aspect with respect to uh, like exactly what we will have to or what we will be beginning up with today here so now uh, since most of you are already here so let's go on with the discussion with respect to the current affairs from the month of february right so in case anybody has any doubts with respect to anything you can always let me know in the chat section i am checking the chat box just to see in case you guys have any messages or any queries that you need to ask right so going on further from here let's get going and let's discuss about the first one here that is eastern ghat a browning east now what do we mean by this what exactly was the you know the meaning or uh, like what was the intention behind writing such a thing right so basically uh, it adheres to it uh, generally talks about what effects of climate change have been witnessed right especially the eastern ghats now if i am to ask you when we speak about the various biodiversity hotspots in india right so i hope you guys know that there are four of them in india and the four biodiversity hotspots in india comprise of your what all things we have the himalayas right first of all those areas there then what do we have we have the eastern himalayas right then we like indo burma region that basically comes in here up till there then we talk about the sunda land region and then we also have the western ghats right so for that matter if we are to classify it as a biodiversity hotspot eastern ghats are not one of those right so eastern ghats do not fall under a biodiversity hotspot category now speaking about the first thing here so climate change impacts warnings for eastern ghats underscore the need for their protection if the western ghats are the crown jewels of india's natural heritage the eastern ghats spread across some about 75000 square kilometers from odisha to the southern tamil nadu region right talking about the eastern ghats so eastern ghats run almost parallel to the coast of india leaving broad plains between their base and the coast right hello aditya it is basically a chain of highly broken right it's not as continuous and detached hill starting from the mahanadi in odisha to the vagai in tamil nadu right and it is important to mention here that eastern ghats almost disappeared kahan par jo kg basin hai the godavari and krishna area they completely disappear over here and they lose their hilly character and are occupied by gondwana formations right please note that the kg basin is here they are eroded and cut through by four major rivers that is godavari we have mahanadi we have krishna and then we have kaveri right the uh, speaking of the next thing here so eastern ghats are older than the western ghats right eastern ghats are also lower in elevation than the western ghats right the highest peak of the eastern ghats is the mahendragiri right and it receives annual rainfall of about 1200 mm to 1500 mm right please note that the western and eastern ghats meet at the nilgiri hills very important this is something i think everybody knows and you are definitely taught about this in your geography portion or the geography segment right going on further talking about the next aspect over here so when we speak about the significance of eastern ghats so since we are talking about it what is so important about the eastern ghats right 
So first of all, it is a huge biodiversity reservoir of our country. So the first function here is fostering biodiversity and storing energy in trees, right? Very first one. Secondly, in these mountains exist a reservoir of about 3,000 flowering plant species, nearly 100 of them being endemic ones, occurring in the dry, deciduous, moist, deciduous and semi-evergreen landscapes, right? So that is pretty much very common here. Many animals, including tigers and elephants, and some about 400 bird species are also found in the discontinuous forests here. It also provides ecosystem services to millions. Now, again, reiterating to the fact, what do we understand by ecosystem services? So various functions that are discharged by nature, for example, climate regulation, temperature control, water, decomposition, nutrient cycling, all these different purposes that are provided for or that are basically, you know, done by the nature is or are what we count as or what we categorize as your ecosystem services, right? Then it speaks about modulating climate, especially during the retreat of monsoons, that is the northeastern monsoons, right? That is another important aspect to it over here, right? Now going on further, coming to the next aspect, talking about how Eastern Ghats are facing a threat from the climate change. Now like all other ecosystems on Earth, Eastern Ghats are also going to be vulnerable to climate change, right? It has showed its, its impacts and has had repercussions on almost all the spheres, right? And Eastern Ghats, since they are a very delicate ecosystem as well, they have a lot of issues wherein we speak about the imminent threats from climate change, right? First of all, to begin with, it corroborates to disruption of the annual average temperature and diminished rainfall would decrease the productivity of these forests. In terms of their ability to store carbon and provide subsistence material. Now, store carbon here corroborates to what? It corroborates to the green carbon that is stored over here that is referred to as your carbon sequestration, right? Going on further, it also leads to the impoverishment of areas experiencing rainfall reduction in the driest quarter of the year and a rise in seasonal temperature reflected in reduced plant species diversity, right? So this is also something that is very well noted here. Also, please note, by some estimates, the Ghats have shrunk by 16% over the past century and just one region that is the Papikonda National Park in Andhra Pradesh has lost about 650 square kilometers in two decades from 1991 right so that has been noted over here right going on further coming to the next one here it talks about the measures to be taken so what kind of measures need to be or can be taken here First of all, protecting the Eastern Ghats is an ecological imperative, right? Schemes for restoration of forest peripheries to indigenous plant and tree species must be pursued, very important. Then relieving the pressure on forests can be done through policies that reduce extraction of scarce resources and incentivize settled agriculture, right? That can be done over here. Then India should fulfill its commitments under the Paris Agreement as well to create an additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons through enhanced forest and tree cover, right? So all these kinds of measures also need to be taken up here, right? So that is about it, right? Now coming on to the next thing, very, very important. This is about CMS COP13, almost the last global summit that took place this year before the corona outbreak took over the entire world. So basically what happened with respect to this? So please note that India has officially taken over its presidency for the next three years till the year 2023 and CMS COP13 was the largest ever in the history of the convention, right? The conference of parties is the decision making organ of the convention, right? And CMS COP13 was the first of a series of international nature related meetings in 2020, which will culminate with the UN Biodiversity Conference in Kunming in China in October, which is expected to adopt a new global biodiversity framework that is the post-2020 global biodiversity framework over here, right? 
So that is going to be taken up over here. All right. Now talking about the key highlights of CMS COP13, what is happening here? First of all, it talks about adoption of the Gandhinagar Declaration, right, which calls for migratory species and the concept of ecological connectivity to be integrated and prioritized in the post-2020 bio global biodiversity framework, which is expected to be adopted at the UN Biodiversity Conference in October this year. Right. Going further, speaking about the decisions on new species, 10 new species were added to the CMS appendices at COP13. Right. So this was done here. Now, please note, seven species were added to Appendix 1, which provides the strictest protection. The Asian elephant, the jaguar, great Indian bustard, Bengal florican, little bustard, Andipodian albatross, and the oceanic white tip shark. The urea, the, small, uh, the smooth uh, hammerhead shark and the taupe shark were also listed for protection under Appendix 2 which covers migratory species that have an unfavorable conservation status. Right, That is not enough conservation activities or conservation programs have been taken up to safeguard the same and it would benefit from enhanced international cooperation on various conservation actions here. Right. Please note that the new and extended concerted actions with targeted conservation plans were agreed for 14 species, right? So for how many? Just uh, as many as 14 species those plans were agreed to or agreed upon, right? Now talking about India and conservation of migratory species, right? So if we look at what kind of a scenario is in place in India. So when we speak about India, so India has, uh, like India is uh, very diverse when we talk about the biodiversity aspect, right? So India mein kya hai? India mein jab hum log baat karte hai, so India is also home to around 500 species of migratory birds from across the globe, right? So India has a lot of migratory species surviving over here, right? Now several protected areas are there in India and they share common boundaries with protected areas of the neighboring countries, right? Also, please note that India is a part of the Central Asian Flyway for migratory birds, right? It is with a view to conserve the birds along the Central Asian Flyway and their habitats, India has prepared a national action plan for conservation of migratory birds along the Central Asian Flyway, right? You might sometimes be asked questions about the Central Asian Flyway, so please make sure you guys do know about it when you are answering, right? Also, please note that India recently hosted the steering committee of the Global Snow Leopard Ecosystem Program of 12 countries and it resulted in New Delhi Declaration envisaging development of a country specific framework and cooperation between countries for snow leopard conservation, right? India by 2020 will be launching its marine turtle policy and marine standing management policy as well, which are roughly aimed at addressing the pollution caused by microplastics, right? So that is with respect to it over here. All right. Now going on further, talking about the visionary perspective plan for the conservation of avian diversity. So please note that recently the government of India has placed the draft visionary perspective plan for the conservation of avian diversity, fed ecosystems, habitats and landscapes in the country in public domain. There are about 544 important bird biodiversity areas, that is IBAs in the country, out of which 506 sites have globally threatened species, right? So about uh, 506 sites jo hai, which are designated so in India, they have species which are globally threatened, right? So that makes it all the more important for, uh, you know, the conservation efforts to be, uh, you know, taken up in all, uh, like, you know, with all zest and fervor, right? Going on further, there are presently 2,1503 wetlands, most of which are under stress due to the impacts of urbanization and agricultural runoffs. The visionary plan has proposed to carry out 15 major programs and various activities which should be implemented over short term, medium term and long term, right? 
This is an addition to India's National Wildlife Action Plan, which too has several conservation actions for the protection of birds and their habitat, right? The MOEFCC had also come out with India's National Action Plan for conservation of migratory birds and their habitats along the Central Asian Flyway, right? So that is what has been doing the rounds for all this fight, right? Going on further, coming to the next aspect over here, talking about what else is important here. So obviously, when we are talking about conservation and all these things, so there are certain challenges which are faced by, uh, you know, by the, like this entire system or wherein we are trying to, uh, like, take up conservation here, right? So what has happened with respect to that? There has there has been an immense pressure when we speak of the anthropogenic activities, right? So whenever we talk about anthropogenic activities, there has been a immense uh, pressure with respect to that, right? So a lot of issues are there, a lot of things are not taken proper care of. So those kind of issues are definitely there that are there, right? So that is something that is observed. Then prevalent bird trade, right? So though uh, when we speak of India, right? Uh, so when we talk about uh, like the bird trade in India, so a lot of areas are there wherein uh, the bird trade is completely banned, right? So despite exotics, both of them in India, over 370, uh, what do we say, bird species that are there are reportedly traded in more than 900 markets. So you see the huge quantum here. So this activity is illegal. It is banned. There is a complete ban that is in place. But despite that, there have been about 300, 370 bird species which are reportedly traded in more than 900 markets all across the globe making the country the third highest in bird trade globally, right? Going on further, it speaks of the low conviction rate. How the low conviction rate? Due to lack of legally admissible evidence with respect to authenticity of the species, identification by enforcement agencies. This is a problem here, right? Also, not just this, there have been numerous bird epidemics that have actually taken place. So, as there is inadequate study and appropriate mechanisms to control bird diseases, for example, over 1,700 birds at the Sample Lake were reported to have succumbed to avian botulism caused by Clostridium botulinum, that is uh, because of food poisoning, right? So, if this are uh, like epidemics, so there's sometimes there's avian influenza, sometimes there's something else. So, all these issues are problematic when it comes to the health of all these birds, right? So definitely they can succumb to all such issues over here, right? It can be very, very problematic for them, right? So if there are bird diseases, so it will be very difficult and they might succumb to such diseases, right? Is this clear to everyone? Have you guys understood the same? I hope that is clear to everybody here. All right. Now coming on to the next aspect that we need to discuss, that is key highlights of the vision plan. So when we speak of this vision plan that needs to be in place for us to, you know, amp up or take up the conservation efforts. So first of all, bird surveys in select landscapes, right? to identify new IBS, that is what, that is your uh, like the like biodiversity protection areas that are to be set up, right, for conservation of birds and other biodiversity. Obviously, all other things are conserved. Then species recovery programs for critically endangered birds. Then conservation of migratory birds, right, Followed by study the impact of anthropogenic activities which are going to be here, right? Furthermore, awareness generation and crowdsourcing by developing a national network of bird watchers for effective dissemination of information and success stories on bird conservation through citizen science initiatives and electronic media, right? So that needs to be done here. Then when we speak about the implementing agencies, like who's going to come to the rescue for implementation? So when we speak about implementing agencies over here, what do we have here? So it will be implemented by different stakeholders, including ministries, right? Uh, what uh, like, like the, with the Salim Ali Center of Ornithology and Natural History, right? 
being the nodal institution for this purpose uh, the ministry of environment forest and climate change that is moefcc is the focal ministry right is that clear have you guys understood this much all right now going on further coming to the next one here so talking about highways through under uh, through tiger reserves and underpass just a minute all right anyway now continuing so uh, basically the, this one's like really important here guys whenever we speak of your uh, you know crossings and all those areas so usually kya hota hai like a lot of man animal conflict a lot of issues related to man animal conflict arise when we talk about different kinds of biodiversity being affected or impacted because of the traffic and other things here right so kahin par bahut sara traffic hai kahin par kuch aur issue hai so whenever that happens it is going to be a problem right so that is exactly what happens here right now what can we do instead to safeguard all those species hamare paas kya alternative hai kya option hai hum kya kar sakte hain instead of that so highways through tiger reserves and underpasses can be very well uh, like you know a suggestion that we have here or can be a source which we can uh, actually be adhering to so as to make sure that the conservation is in line with what efforts that uh, need to be drawn up now please note that the arunachal pradesh government is planning to build a highway named east west industrial corridor which includes a 40 km elevated stretch through the core areas of pakhui tiger reserve aapne suna hoga pakhui is uh, the name for pakhui tiger reserve right so pakhui tiger is a uh, reserve as we know it is also called as pakhui locally right please note very very important and where is it it is in the state of arunachal pradesh very important please remember now speaking about the effects of highways on wildlife habitat so first of all what what all things does it do Firstly it restricts the free movement where traffic is high in volume and velocity this can lead to effective loss of hunting grounds pastures or water sources for animals we can also break canopy connectivity for arboreal animals such as the lion tailed macaw all right going on further it is also responsible for the degradation of habitat as well as increased mortality cases out here right then it also restricts gene flow as there is risk of inbreeding of disease and ultimately of local extinction as well right also a study predicted that if intrusion such as roads continue at the rate vital heterozygosity would decrease by as much as 50% in the next century right so that is about it right so please take note of the same now coming on further talking about the steps which have been taken so this basically corroborates to what all things have we done or that can be done right in order to ensure that uh, you know such kind of damage does not take place or does not occur what options do we have first of all it begins with your night traffic bans right it firstly begins with night traffic bans then in 2018 the national board for wildlife made it mandatory for every road or rail project proposal to include a wildlife passage plan as per guidelines framed by the wildlife institute of india in 2019 the ministry of road transport and highways ask the national highways authority of india that is nhai now very important and various states to avoid building railways or highways or anything of the sorts through wildlife sanctuaries national parks unless absolutely avoidable so agar kahin par aapko alternatives available hai so might as well uh, you know uh, just uh, avail them instead of uh, harming the biodiversity here 
एज फार एज नाइट ट्रैफिक बैन इशू गोज आपने सुना ही होगा देर इज दिस बंदीपुर नेशनल पार्क वेर इन वी स्पीक ऑफ और वेर इन इट टॉक्स अबाउट हाउ देर इज अ नाइट ट्रैफिक बैन इन कर्नाटका राइट सो एब्सोल्यूटली नो वहीकल्स फ्लाई थ्रू हियर एट नाइट एंड दिस इज वेरी वेरी इफेक्टिव ऑल्सो इट हैज एक्चुअली हेल्प टू ब्रिंग डाउन द एक्सीडेंटल केसेज वेर इन अ लॉट ऑफ वाइल्ड लाइफ इज हार्म एंड दे डाई बिकॉज ऑफ सकामिंग इंजरीज ड्यू टू सम यू नो हाई लाइक विलोसिटी और हाई स्पीड वहीकल हिटिंग दैम राइट और एनी ट्रक हिटिंग दैम फॉर दैट मैन Now also note that commissioning of underpasses for animals, example three to seven kilometer elevated stretch of highways on the Sioni, uh, like that is in Madhya Pradesh and Nagpur, that is in Maharashtra sector of NH44 passing through the Paint Tiger Reserve. This provides five underpasses and four minor bridges to ensure that movements of animals is not disrupted. Right, so no disruption in the movement is noted. right is that clear to everyone so i hope this is clear to everybody here right so that is what happens over here right now going on further coming to the next one that is arsenic contamination in ground water right what do we understand by arsenic contamination in ground water here so 21 states across the country have pockets with arsenic levels higher than the bureau of indian standards that is bis right uh, stipulated permissible limits of 0.01 mg per liter right the states along the ganga brahmaputra and meghna river basin in up bihar jharkhand west bengal and assam are the worst affected uh, uh, why because of arsenic poisoning now if you guys are already already aware of the fact arsenic poisoning causes what it causes the black foot disease now isko yaad karne ka bahut easy tarika hai hamare paas so most of you would have heard about the football club that is arsenal someone hit a football like very hard with the foot right so us foot turned black so you can remember black foot disease like that right so remember what does arsenic poisoning cause arsenic poisoning causes black foot disease all right now going on further please note that arsenic contamination in ground water has penetrated the food chain yet mitigation measures are targeted in the treatment of ground water or supply of surface water right also please note that government testing of water sources for arsenic contamination has also been restricted to drinking water sources and it has not widened the scope of investigation to water sources used for irrigation right so that is another important aspect over here right next when we speak about the consequences of arsenic contamination what does that mean so when we are discussing about the consequences of arsenic contamination it basically adheres or corroborates to drinking of arsenic rich water right drinking of arsenic rich water results in skin cancers cancers of the bladder kidney and lung diseases of the blood vessels and also various reproductive disorders right so all these things can occur right also please note that regular extraction of ground water for irrigation deposits arsenic in soil and consequently its uptake by the crops is there right also paddy farms flooded with contaminated water eventually causes accumulation of arsenic in the food crops right so usse kya hota there is an accumulation of arsenic in the food crops right i hope this is clear to everybody now right this is another very common aspect over here now please note rice husk used as fodder for livestock exposes them to impacts of arsenic contamination this leads to potential risks for humans when they consume cattle based food products right the presence of arsenic in food crops means spread of arsenic is much wider and beyond the ganga brahmaputra meghna basin right so it is very very far spread right it's all over the area over here right also note that the entry of arsenic into the food chain in addition to drinking water increases possibilities of biomagnification right and when we speak about biomagnification it is the concentration of a toxin 
such as pesticides at successively higher levels in a food chain, right? So that is what happens with respect to the arsenic contamination situation here, right? Going on further, talking about the methods, methods to tackle arsenic contamination, right? So what all things are there? So first of all, obviously, since it is so widespread, you need to come up with the methane, right? So what all options do we have when it comes to tackling arsenic poisoning or arsenic contamination? First of all, we need to have proper treatment technologies, right? So treatment technologies based on oxidation, co-precipitation, adsorption, ion exchange and membrane processes has been developed for removal of arsenic from the contaminated water, right? Also, among the various removal technologies, lime softening and iron co-precipitation have been re reported to be the most effective, right? Further, innovative technologies such as permeable reactive barriers, phytoremediation, biological treatment, and electrokinetic kinetic treatment are also being used to treat arsenic contaminated water and soil. Right? And lastly, rainwater harvesting and recharging of groundwater table is necessary to avoid fall in groundwater level and to check upon leaching of metals into the groundwater sources, right? So all these things are also very, very important. Going on further, talking about the habitat loss and felt leopards, right? So what happened with respect to that? Now, this one is very important. So I hope you guys are well aware of the fact that there is a fine line of difference between the cheetah and the leopard. Both of them are different. So India still has various leopards in it, but cheetahs are locally extinct in India. When we were discussing the January current affairs, we did discuss about the fact how there was this, uh, you know, how the Supreme Court had given an approval on, uh, like to the NTCA, wherein it has allowed for the relocation of, uh, like, you know, the cheetahs, that is the African cheetahs from Namibia to come and, you know, take part or settle down in the Kuno Palpur Wildlife Sanctuary. And also note that the Kuno Palpur Wildlife Sanctuary is no longer a wildlife. All right, so please note now this is called as what? Now this is called as your Kuno National Park, right? So now what previously was the Kuno Palpur Wildlife Sanctuary, now it is referred to as your Kuno National Park, right? K-U-N-O, Kuno National Park, right? Now going on further, coming to the discussion with respect to ultra mega renewable energy parks. Now what do we understand by the ultra mega renewable energy parks? What do we understand by that? So what do we understand by the ultra mega renewable energy parks? So basically the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, that is MNRE, right? So the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy, right? So basically the ministry has or basically there's this program where it, it has expressed aims to set up ultra mega renewable energy uh, basically uh, parks with capacity of total 150 gigawatt in the states of Gujarat and Rajasthan, right? So these two areas, they want to set up such national, such huge uh, energy parks. Also, the initiative could be one of the greatest, right? For it would help immensely, right? So the initiative could be one of the lar uh, like the largest investment programs in the world. And Khawada in Gujarat and Jaisalmer in Rajasthan have been identified for the RE parks of 2,500 megawatts and 25 each, right? RE matlab renewable energy right so that is there all right now going on further uh, land could be made available for setting up the solar wind and wind hybrid plants right so all of them are your renewable energy varieties right there's a renewable energy variants and renewable energy sources right and uh, these are being proposed uh, these are basically the proposed parks and would have resistance right? So, yeah, important here because usually you would not consider Ministry of Defense to give such approval. Also, note that the Ministry of Power has also been requested to strengthen transmission to these locations within 24 months for evacuation of power from these parks, right? So, that is about it, right? Also, when we speak about the ultra mega renewable energy parks, what all things are there? So, please note that the mega, uh, 
renewable energy parks uh, has undertaken a scheme to develop these under the existing solar park scheme so you must have heard about uh, like the solar parks previously right so you must have heard about the solar parks right so it is in co like uh, consonance to that the objective of the um uh, repp is uh, to provide land upfront to the project developer and facilitate transmission infrastructure for developing renewable energy based ultra mega renewable energy parks with solar wind hybrid and also with the storage systems if required right the implementing agencies of these may be special purpose vehicles in form of a joint venture company to be set up between the cpsu that is central public sector unit undertakings and any state public sector undertaking or state utility or agency of the government or a special purpose vehicle that is like a body or an organization separately created fully owned by a cpsu or a spv fully owned by any state state utility agency or state government etc right so all these things would be there right so that is about it all right furthermore various companies such as the ntpc that is national thermal power corporation secci have proposed to set up the umrepps of around 42000 megawatts in various states right so it is a very ambitious and a big project that is underway over here right so that is about it all right so i guess this is mostly all the information with respect to so might as well talk about the advantages of the same right so what all are the advantages here so first of all provide common development zones that it offers developers location that is well characterized with proper infrastructure and access to amenities where the risk of projects can be minimized right secondly increased investments so it increases the investment potential of already preferred renewable energy second flows of about 3.22 billion over the last 4 years right then enabling the plug and play model government has proposed the parks will already have necessary clearances and hence the developers can start production without any delay right and lastly talks about provision of related services so services like secure financing and whether monitoring could be provided in large scale parks right so all these services are also going to be very well provided for over here right so that is there all right uh just take down you didn't i did not write the name so now this is the kuno national park right so the, for the cheetahs coming in it is the kuno national park right it's in the state of you tell me it's in the state of where is kuno national park guys anybody kaun si state mein up mein ki mp mein soch ke batana all right now coming to talking about treatment of waste waters now having realized that there is a limited supply or a limited uh, what do we say uh, you know reservoir of water on earth right it is not going to last endlessly right so it's not going to last endlessly over here so we need or we might as well will have to treat the grey water waste water and all those things right so we will have to account for those things as well right is that clear to everyone have you guys understood the same is that clear right now when we speak about such things right so when we talk about all these things so basically what has happened in respect to this so we have so many water scarce countries and all those things right so when we speak of all those things we have this issue wherein we talk about various areas wherein we do not have a substantial quantity of water there right so recently the study by the united nations university institute of water uh, environment and health noted that the efficiency or that efficiently treating water can help meet the sustainable development goals right so there are 17 sustainable development goals that have been put across right so usme se bahut sari cheeze aur bahut sare issues jo hai wo water ki availability ke around you know they are uh, just working around that right so recently the study by un has put across that if we uh, want to make sure that the sdgs are met with and there is no issue with respect to water scarcity it is going to be very important to make sure that the, there is proper treatment of or whenever we speak about of your waste water 
right? So that is going to be another important aspect over here, right? The world generates about 380 trillion liters of wastewater every year, which is projected to rise roughly by 51%, uh, like, you know, by the year 2050 to 20, 2574 uh, liters, right? So, itna zyada hona is very, very big, right? Nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium recovered from wastewater produced annually can offset about 13.4% of the global demand to produce fertilizers. So you must be aware of the fact that NPK are the fertilizers that are given, right? That is the fertilizer concoction that is given, usually put in fields. And most of it does escape the fields in terms of wastewater, surface runoff and all those things, right? So once there is going to be that wastage of water that is going to be here, so might as well recover it. So when we know that wastewater is going to be wala hai, there is going to be refuse that is going to come out and the water is going to be contaminated. So might as well make sure that before entering a water source, wherein it pollutes all these things, why not treat it, right? If proper treatment of the water or the wastewater coming out of all these areas is done, we will be able to ensure that we have a proper, uh, you know, uh, we will be able to recover all these nutrients from it, right? And that means like as the data here provided states that 13.4% of the global demand to produce fertilizers can actually come down, right? So that is what can happen here, right? Then usable water reclaimed from wastewater can irrigate up to 31 million hectares of agricultural land, right? Also, with full energy recovery, current wastewater volume could provide enough methane fuel to power 196 million households by 2030 and 239 million households by the year 2050. Another important aspect here. Also note, Asia contributed the most at 42% of the global wastewater generation, Europe and North America at 18% each in 2050, right? Also, at per capita level, rich countries in North America generated almost 140% more than the world average and Europe's per capita output was half the, of that of North America's, right? So, this is important. Also, talking about the present scenario when all the resources are in scarcity and there is a huge problem with respect to the huge amount of pressure on resources, the only option that we have in order to get out of the situation nicely is to ensure a sustainable development scenario right so if there is sustainable development right everything is properly taken care of all the resources are channelized before they are being utilized that is what is going to do the trick for us right that is there now talking about the indian pangolin now why is the indian pangolin important here so please note that the scientists have radio tagged the Indian pangolin, which is an endangered animal, right? Tagging the animal will help us understand the habits of reclusive nocturnal animal here. And radio tagging is a part of joint project by the forest department and the non-profit organization that is the Wildlife Conservation Trust, right? So that is going to be another very, very important factor out here, right? So that is about it, right? I hope that is clear. Now, when we talk about Indian pangolin, this is like this is one of the most trafficked species. आपने कभी देखा होगा जब भी reports आती हैं, so even newspapers में होता है like northeast and uh, West Bengal and all these areas. बहुत सारे areas जो हैं, these are like very, very illing and trafficking the pangolin, right? It is done. Right. First of all, it is hunted for its meat. It's regarded as a delicacy in certain places. And secondly, as we know, for Chinese medicine, right? Half time they're sp spreading diseases and in others they're making certain medicine concoctions. So they do take up this uh, pangolin for certain, you know, components that they derive out of it for procuring and manufacturing certain medicines that they do, right? So that is about it. Right. Now talking about the Indian pangolin here, it has thick scaly skin, right? It is hunted for its meat and is used in traditional Chinese medicine, right? 
also pangolins are among the most trafficked wildlife species in the world right so what happens here they are one of the most trafficked right Huma like lots of articles regarding the trafficking of the same do surface every day right bahut sare articles aate in newspapers mein when we speak of it right so that is that Now coming to the last aspect, talking about the Malay Mahadeshwara Wildlife Sanctuary. So, what is so important with respect to that? So now, uh, as I told you previously, just so like your Kuno Palpur Wildlife Sanctuary, jo tha, that became a national park, right? Kuno Palpur Wildlife Sanctuary became a national park. Sometimes, when we talk about certain conservation efforts, certain tiger reserves and like certain wildlife sanctuaries are made into tiger reserves. Sometimes wildlife sanctuaries areas are increased and they are converted into maybe national parks or reserves, whatever the case may be, depending upon the requirement. So please note that the approval from the NTCA, that is the National Tiger Conservation Authority, is expected to notify the Malai Mahadeshwara Wildlife Sanctuary as a tiger reserve, right? Now, National Tiger Conservation Authority, जो है वो क्या है? It is a statutory body by 2006 amendment of the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. Now, this is slightly important. Many times there are questions with respect to this. ये क्या है? How it's working? What is its functioning regarding? Right? Then it is launched. It was launched in 2005, and recommendations of the Tiger Task Force were there. then supervisory or coordinational role uh, performing functions as provided in the wildlife protection act of 1972 then m stripes which is the monitoring system of tigers intensive protection and ecological status ye kya hai it is basically an app based monitoring system right launched across indian tiger reserves by the ntca in the year 20 uh, 2010 right so that is with respect to it right so this is what is happening here now that was almost all the current affairs for today guys right so just remember a few things in news because since we have so many wildlife sanctuaries so many national parks in the country it is not imperative to remember each and every one of them right you will or you are not expected to remember all of them the only key that you have here to solving this issue or you know learning all these national parks and sanctuaries here is that you revise them well right So just revise them well. Make sure you guys cover it comprehensively and talk about issues or talk about things as to when and how they need to be taken care of, right? So the when and how needs to be uh, properly addressed here. Like whenever there is a certain national park or a wildlife sanctuary that has been like you know that has been in news for quite some time, you have to remember that, right? So if that has been discussed extensively, you need to talk about that, right? so that is what is important for us over here right so that part you remember other than that uh, do take a note of as to how many different kinds of your uh, you know uh, like different national parks that have been there and all those things so that is what makes it important and that is usually what is covered as well right so that is usually what is covered uh, in newspapers and all those things so whatever things you find in news right so whatever things you are going to find in news and all those things that part you cover and that is all about it right so that is pretty much all you have to remember from here right so just take a note of that so anything that has been covered in papers or has been extensively covered that part you remember right so that is pretty much all we need to do over here is this clear to everyone have you guys understood this much is it clear All right. So before we sum up for today, let's quickly uh, take up a discussion here, right? Let's quickly take up a discussion and quickly revise through everything that we have just covered here, right? So let's just have a look at that, right? Just a moment. All right. Now talking about the February aspect here. So February me ek issue tha Eastern Ghats, Browning East, contributing or talking about all the various uh, you know aspects related to say for instance deterioration of habit habitat and how it is basically you know uh, degrading in nature and how it is basically uh, you know like so much vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Right. That aspect we have covered. What they are, kaise hai, significance kya hai. we've discussed 
this is important where we spoke about how it faces a threat from climate change right also when we speak about the measures to be taken we have discussed them as well extensively right so what measures need to be taken up has also been extensively discussed over here right so that part also we have discussed also we have discussed the fact that when we speak about the four biodiversity hotspots in india we know that there are how many there are four of them so speaking about the four biodiversity hotspots in india what is important the thing important here is the fact that out of these four biodiversity hotspots we have himalayas then we have the eastern himalayas and indo burma then we have sundaland and lastly we have the western ghats at no point of time here are the eastern ghats a part of this right so eastern ghats jo hain aapke they are not a part of this right so please very very important to note make sure you remember that the eastern ghats are not a part of this right going on further talking about cms cop 13 so please note that india has officially taken over its presidency for the next 3 years till 2023 and what exactly is the post 2020 global frame biodiversity framework iske alawa whatever the key highlights are that have been discussed over here right so the key highlights have also been discussed over here right so they have also been discussed here and then we've also at length discussed about the issue with respect to india and conservation of the various migratory species out here right so we have at length discussed this part as well right so that is an important aspect to it right going on further we've also discussed about the visionary perspective plan 2020-30 for the conservation of avian diversity what do we understand by the avian diversity that means the birds right so the entire bird biodiversity all the bird biodiversity areas that are very well a part of it right going on further talking about the challenges faced in conservation of birds in india we have discussed that part right so we have very well discussed the part related to the challenges of uh, faced by the birds in india numerous humong numerous humongous challenges are there which we have already spoken about key highlights of the vision plan have also been discussed can be an important means question right it can be important so just summarize it once before you go so that you are able to uh, like you know put points in place if required right then talking about highways through tiger reserves and underpasses that is also discussed here right so make sure you guys don't take a note of that as well talking about the steps taken we have a couple of steps that can be or that have been taken talking about night traffic bans and various underpasses all those things can be taken up here right so that is another important aspect to it then talking about the arsenic contamination in groundwater we have to understand that it is widespread it is found all across india in numerous parts and we must or we definitely have to make sure that uh, the water is treated we also had discussed as to how unesco and other agencies have spoken about the fact that how arsenic is poisoning india's waters how it is contaminating the same and how it is very very important to make sure that the sustainable development development goals are adhered to right that is there also speaking about habitat loss felt leopards we've discussed we also related uh, how leopards are different from cheetahs and there is a cheetah a reintroduction program uh, running from africa into india and we've also discussed about how cheetahs are locally extinct in india then we also discussed about ultra mega renewable energy parks can be a very important and a direct question for mains exams right a direct question can stem out of it as to what are ultra mega renewable energy parks what is the benefit how they are going to function and associated issues over here right so you might as well be asked about it right going on further talking about the next aspect we've discussed the advantages at length so make sure you put them in perspective over here right so do take note of all the advantages here talking about the treatment of wastewater that part also we have discussed comprehensively right talking about the indian pangolin we've discussed how it is an endangered animal and it is one of the most widely smuggled animals all across the borders and especially for its tender meat which is a delicacy and for various uses found in the chinese medicine right 
Then we lastly spoke about the Malai Mahadeshwara Wildlife Sanctuary, which is now to be designated as a Tiger Reserve, and where it is located, what all things are there, what is NTCA, that all, like all those things have been discussed here, right? On that note, I will conclude the session here for today, guys. Tomorrow, we will have another session from 12.15 to 1.15, right? So, tomorrow, the session is going to be from 12.15 to 1.15 p.m., wherein we will be talking about the next aspect or the next issue wherein we'll take up uh, the aspect related to current affairs from the month of March 2020, right? So, abhi lockdown hua nahi hai, abhi hone laga hai. So, a lot of things did happen around this time. Iske baad to bohat kam cheeze hongi, right? So, a lot of things will stop happening post this. But this is the time up till when we did have, a, like, you know, a couple of things happening all across the globe. Right? So, that is there. So, on that note, I'll conclude the session here for today, guys. So, that will be all for today. So, thank you so much for attending the session. I hope you guys have understood everything clearly. In case you still have doubts with respect to anything, please feel free to reach out to me right so please keep that in mind so remember tomorrow we have a class from like again from 12 15 to 1 15 right we will be discussing about various current affairs there right so from the month of march the current affairs pertaining to the month of march will be discussed there right so that is what we are going to take up tomorrow and after we are done with that we'll be continuing with the current affairs from the month of april like if there will be any we will uh, discuss about those and otherwise we will finish the month of March and quickly revise it once tomorrow, right? So that is about it. So I hope you guys are thoroughly clear about all the things here, especially the treatment of wastewater, Indian pangolin, Malai Mahadeshwara, wildlife sanctuary and all those things. So on that note, I will be concluding the session for today now, right? So thank you so much for attending the session here, guys. I hope you guys have understood everything clearly. In case you still have any doubts with respect to anything, please feel free to reach out to me. I will be glad to take up all your doubts. And uh, in case you want to attend the next session, that will be from 12.15 to 1.15 tomorrow. And please make sure you guys turn up on time right so thank you so much for attending the session i hope you guys have understood everything clearly in case of any issues reach out to me study well revise well and take care and i hope you guys have a great sunday ahead have a great day bye 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 bye